So let's talk about the history of the internet a little bit. Uh, this is something I feel is important to understand where the internet came from. It didn't just spring out of nothingness uh, and now we have this fantastic globally interconnected uh, media system. Uh, the internet really, if you want to go back to it, started around the 1800s. Um, go back to the telegraph which happened around like the 1830s to 1840s, somewhere around there, uh, was where the telegraph really started to allow people to communicate uh, a bit faster than sending letters uh, by horseback and such, which laid the foundation for where are we going to be running uh, overland cables and inter uh, interconnecting cities and things like that. That really started with the uh, the telegraph in the vis Victorian internet time. Uh, after the telegraph really started to get popular over land, uh, people wanted to communicate to each other uh, from the United States to uh, England, for example, and so that's where uh, submarine cables started to come into play all the way back in the 1800s. And I apologize for my handwriting. I'm trying. <laughs> submarine cables. Uh, they came about uh, a little bit after the telegraph uh, started, so that was 18... 50s to the 1860s, somewhere around there. Uh, and actually, there's a very fascinating uh, television show uh, about laying submarine cables. Now, the ones back in 1800s, they were very crude to our current technology. Um, cables, you know, copper cables wrapped in like tar and stuff like that. And they constantly had breaks and problems, and they were just an absolute nightmare. It took forever to get them to actually work through some some fashion uh, across the Atlantic which where they started and it just was uh, a nightmare um, but there's a fascinating uh, documentary about it uh, the show Mighty Ships which sh uh, was on the Discovery Channel um, they might be still going I'm not sure well, they had they had some as of last year I'm not sure if season 8 is coming or not but uh, in the first season they had an episode on the Tycho Resolute, which was a cable laying ship, uh, largest one, I believe it's the largest one, uh, at least when they recorded it, uh, that lays undersea cables. Uh, now, of course, nowadays we use fiber optic cables and big bundles and such. But if you want to learn more about undersea uh, cable laying, this this episode on the Tycho Resolute is fascinating. Uh, you might be able to find it on like. Amazon Instant or something like that. Uh, go go look it up online. You might be able to find uh, a way to watch this episode. It's very 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 interesting. So after submarine cables came about and people started connecting cities, you know they wanted to, uh, and and that, that really started the whole telephone network idea. You know we had this telegraph across the ocean, across the country, and things like that. Um, people wanted to. Uh, use these networks for more purposes once um, analog computers and computers started to come into play. So there was, there's a period of time here where there's not much happening, but then once the 1950s hit, uh, post-World War II, that's really when we started to see computers start to come on to the scene. Uh, we had some analog computers and such in, uh, you know, before then, but the, the 50s is really where things started to, started to happen. Uh, so with the 50s, we started to say, okay, well, we have these computers now, or these um, introductory computers, that uh, we want to send data from one to the other. And instead of sending punch cards on foot from one to the other, or printing out um, uh, results and moving them by sneaker net from one location to another, let's try and get them to communicate to each other. Uh, and... Starting out, it was really mainframe computers in the 1950s. So that was this is where you started to see connections between devices really start to happen from a computer standpoint. Uh, so mainframes came in around the 1950s, and you'd have you know your main central server, which is actually it's kind of funny because we went from this system and we went to a client server model, which we'll talk about later, and now we're kind of going back to the mainframe model in a way with virtualization. Uh, every everyone's going back to a centralized system because it's easier to manage. Um, but it's it's kind of funny how we've, we're kind of gone full circle now. But in the 1950s, mainframes were big. So you had a main central server, and then you had these uh, 
clients that connected to it. And they accessed that central mainframe. And they had these dedicated cables that connected themselves to it. And that was kind of your beginning of your network and, you know, sharing data amongst systems and such. So we had these mainframes, and then they said, well, okay, well, let's get these mainframes to talk to each other. Uh, maybe we can, you know, send data from, from a client to a mainframe to another mainframe to a client. That'd be really neat. Uh, and so that started around the 1960s, uh, the late 1960s. There were some uh, research being done before then, but it was really started, which, which people reference all the time, uh, ARPANET. So the, the Advanced Research Projects Agency Network <laughs> is what really started the internet, uh, if you want to go back to it. So after mainframes came ARPA. And that was um, a project of DARPA, the Defense uh, Advanced Research Projects Agency. So ARPANET. is thanks to DARPA which they are still around and uh, have the this uh, government agency still around and they do some very interesting uh, research projects still and grants and prizes and stuff like that and contests uh, for interesting advanced technologies such as self-driving cars and that uh, just in the past I think it was like six or seven years or something uh, around like 2007 or 8 I think it was something like that DARPA had a uh, self-driving car challenge and that's kind of where everything exploded around the self-driving car scene uh, they've been very involved in all sorts of interesting uh, advanced research so DARPA spawned the ARPANET and the ARPANET was uh, from like 1960 whoops 1969 that was a terrible six 1969 to uh I think it was like 1985 was really when the ARPANET ran. So people like to reference ARPANET and say that was the beginning of the internet and it blew up from there. But really what's interesting is if you look into it, ARPANET started and ended and then another network started and ended and we'll talk about those. And then the public internet happened after that. It's What we use now as the internet is not the original ARPANET. It, it did end and then they transitioned to another network. But the beginning of how to communicate between devices really happened around the ARPANET. Um, it, the de locations that they interconnected with these mainframes uh, were mostly universities. And if you look online, you'll see interesting uh, first maps of the internet. If you go look that up, there's really interesting this is actually like the first one. I think this was this was like the very first map. I think it was written on a um, on a napkin, <laughs> actually. Uh, and you'll see the there's UCLA and UCSB and SRI. These are universities. Uh, universi I think Utah University or whatever. They all um, interconnected each other, and that's really what was the start of the ARPANET. And then there's some other interesting maps. Uh, I encourage you to go out there and take a look at some of the old maps of the internet. Uh, it's very interesting. You can see all these different universities that were interconnected as part of that uh, research project. Um, so the military took this, th obviously this was run by DARPA, so uh, the military took ARPANET and split that off and so this became MILNET which is still around to this day in one fashion or another. Um, which is the secure communications uh, within our military does not run over the internet it runs over its own network called Milnet uh, and that happened in I believe it was 1983 uh, some of the original protocols uh, that we enjoy to use today even uh, such as email um, SMTP and POP those originate around this time frame they're really they really are that old. <laughs> um, some of them, such as uh, FTP for transferring files to and from servers. Uh, when you download things, sometimes that happens over FTP. Uh, TCP IP, those also happened around this time frame. Uh, a lot of this technology we use dates back to, you know, these 1970s, 60s era. Uh, and if you go look at some of what we'll talk about, the uh, RFCs, they really do date back that far. Uh, so ARPANET had a good run 
it, they learned a lot. They split it off. Um, and so at, in 1985, they shut it down, actually. And uh, during this time frame, the National Science, this is, this is really one of the things that is unfortunate, is that people mentioned DARPA and ARPANET and the universities that were involved. But really, the National Science Foundation had a huge uh, part through the 70s and 80s here. Uh, making the internet what it is today. So ARPANET really started things, but the National Science Foundation really stepped in in 1985, and um, their networks from 1985 up to the present are really what is the internet. Uh, and not many people know that, and it's unfortunate because the National Science Foundation is a great organization. Uh, so I encourage you to, to research that and learn about the National Science Foundation. So 1985... Uh, ARPANET was shut down in favor of the NSFNet. So the NSFNet, obviously National Science Foundation, uh, that was the next version. And there was actually a cutover day, and uh, there was another one too later on, uh, where it actually they said, okay, as of today, you know, we are transitioning to this other network don't use the old one <laughs> it was it's very interesting you can find some of the old emails about that so then the NSF net was uh, an additional uh, it was a break off of ARPANET and they tried some new protocols and tried some new speeds and that's where you started to see some of the faster connections happen around uh, happen back then uh, some of the things we uh, enjoy uh, to use now from a technology standpoint of speed happened with the NSF net. That's where we started to see, um, actually, it, well, it started with a, uh, an original 56K, <laughs> 56K backbone. So it was a 50, 56 kilobit per second backbone. Uh, and then they took that and bundled it and bundled it and bundled it and made it faster and faster and faster. And that actually was then upgraded to a T1, which may sound familiar if you're into networking, uh, which is 1.5 megabits per second. And then it got upgraded again and again and again and again. And uh, you'll learn later on, we'll talk about this, but you can, to go from a T1 to a T3, which it was upgraded to, and then move it on up the chain there to like an OC12 and move it up. Really, with the exception of the optical carrier OC stuff, the Ts are really just bundles and bundles and bundles of more phone lines. <laughs> so to make it faster, they just bundled more and more and more together and said, okay, here, the trunk is bigger. Um, and that's that's really where we saw the the backbone start it was around then. Um, one of the other networks around the NSF net time frame, uh, the which actually ran. Uh, I mentioned NSF net, but really between ARPANET and NSF net was uh, the CS net. And uh, I forgot to mention that. I'm sorry, but CS net actually ran from eighty. I don't like you doing that. <laughs> 1981 to 1984, and then NSFNet came started over in '85. So uh, really, the cutover was '85 from ARPANET to NSFNet, but the CSNet happened in between there, uh, and that was also a uh, National Science Foundation network, uh, and it was used to connect institutions into the ARPANET. So it was really kind of like the middleman network. Um, and uh, th that was then also ended in favor of switching everyone over to the NSF net. So um, just a little side note there on that. Uh, really, it, it because it connected outsiders into the ARPANET, it was kind of, it was like the um, marketing <laughs> for the ARPANET, really. People would connect to the CS net and then they'd get access to the ARPANET. So it was a great way of spreading the word, essentially. So then that got terminated in favor of the NSF net. NSFNet happened, that's where we saw these backbones and the speeds and the technology uh, come into play for all these different speeds that we're used to using today. Um, and I forgot the road over here, it's OC, I think it was a 48. And it just kept getting upgraded from there. Um, NSFNet also was where we saw the beginnings of the BGP protocol, which we do not go into uh, a lot in uh, CCNA, but the Border Gateway Protocol is used for connecting different institutions uh, called autonomous systems. 
or AS, ASs, they um, interconnect through the BGP protocol. And uh, we'll get into that. We'll, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that when we get into the um, dynamic routing protocols later on. But that's where we saw BGP start, really, was in like the early 80s. Uh, also around this time with the NSF net, uh, the commercial ISPs started to get involved. So the CS net got people onto ARPANET and they said, hey, this is a really great thing. And then they switched over to NSF net. And then when NSF net hit, that's really when you started to see the internet service providers come up uh, out of, uh, you know, and, and form. So like uh, they started out as smaller ones. It really wasn't like AT&T and Verizon and all these really big, huge um companies to begin with it was very fractured and we'll talk a little bit more about how that happens uh, and I think believe in the next video we'll do that but um, this is where the providers really came into play and the public started to access the NSF net and that's really where things started from so uh, and that, that's how you kind of got the the actual internet really uh, so you could say the NSF net really is the beginning of the internet because not only do you have these technologies and protocols being developed, but uh, in 1995, the NSF net backbone was uh, decommissioned uh, and they transitioned traffic to the commercial backbone networks. So NSF net died. So NSF net died in 1995, but everything else about it, except for its backbone, lives on. And that was all transitioned to ISP backbones, such as uh, MCI, uh, Sprint, some of the large uh, tier one providers that we'll talk about later. That's, that's where they came into play, it was 1995 actually, which is pretty recent. Uh, but all the other technologies carried over. So, and I'd say NSF net is the beginning of the internet because really all the development that we use today really happened in NSF net. And then they just got rid of the old backbone cables and switched over to the, the uh, private company cables. And that was really the, uh, the beginning of the internet really was right around that 1985 to 1995 for time frame. And then you could say as of 1995, um, that was the switchover point where the public internet as we know it with the backbone tier one providers that is the internet as of 1995 essentially so that's that's a little history of the internet really hopefully that makes some sense um, I encourage you to go check out on Wikipedia and such and learn a bit about these different networks uh, learn about ARPANET and NSFNET and CSNET really interesting readings uh, to enrich yourself and your knowledge on, on how things came to be and uh, it allows you to understand what we talk about later a bit more easily because you can say okay that's that's where that came into play and that's why we have these things uh, and that's what we'll talk about uh, next we'll start talking about internet service providers and uh, tier one two and three providers and things like that those guys that came into play in 1995